Music break. Oh, I should talk about, and uh, I really thought I should just start uh, at the beginning, literally, and uh, talk about what it is that we do, because it is not entirely obvious right from the beginning. Um, I'll talk about how we arrived at the brains and what it means and so forth. Um, we started off back in the day when uh, CDDB, there was a CD database. Any of you guys typed in CDs for CDDB? A couple of us, excellent, good. Um, I was turned on to this project, typed in CDs because the information, the track information is actually not on a CD. So the information has to come from somewhere and this project started for typing this information in, keeping it in a simple repository and then giving access to everyone for it. I thought this was great. And then this company came along. Uh, back in the day, they were called Eshint, and uh, they took this resource private, and I typed in the better part of 200 CDs. <laughs> and magically, I didn't get a check. And they didn't cut me in on the deal, and they took this resource completely private, and uh, it later on became Greystoke, which was then bought by Sony. Um, all I know is I was very unhappy by this, and uh, I really wanted to do something about this. A friend of mine said, uh, you know, I was at a party with him and I was bitching and complaining and he said, you know, why don't you just shut up and go do your own thing and he walked off. He was like, make your own open source projects. But, <laughs> anyway. All right, so, and that's that's where I started off with this absolutely horrific logo. This is the CD <laughs> index. Um, it was literally born out of uh, the desire to create something that was non-compatible with CDDB because I knew that CDDB liked playing with lawyers. And lawyers will get you in court. So if I wanted to go do something that was going to be completely compatible with CDDB, I would end up in court. Well, free CDDB did exactly that. And they ended up in court. And that's why they call free DB now. Yeah. Which doesn't really make much sense, but uh, that's, you know, they, they ended up in court and eventually had to walk out with their tails between their legs. And uh, that didn't work out so well for them. Uh, the CD index was started, and uh, I was between jobs and hacking on stuff, and I got, I got subsumed by eMusic, and then there was a Slashdot posting, and the Slashdot posting said, what is going to be the open replacement for CDDB? And I literally spent <coughs> the entire night, hack, 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 finish, finish, just deploy, and then post to Slashdot, and the thing that happened is that Slashdot happened. They posted the story, and what happened? Everybody, the internet came, overnight. And the first thing that happened is the service took over. <laughs> Which is, you know, what to do. I mean, this was completely virgin software, effectively. Not even alpha quality, right? And I had a slash dot. It was, it was a little stressful. Um, what was interesting about this is that uh, the community that comes out of a slash dot post is, um, well, a little questionable. There was a lot of shouting, a lot of self-entitlement, a lot of, you should do this, a lot of, you should do that. Alan Cox, the Linux kernel maintainer, said that we should scrap this project and we should be doing music identification and lookup services over DNS. <laughs> and he said it would never scale. Databases would never scale and all these other things. It's just, ah. Uh, and this is one of the most intelligent Linux guys out there. So it was a really interesting uh, starting point for, our, for us. And um, I, uh, you know, I got into the space. I didn't particularly like the community. I didn't particularly like the project. Uh, I was kind of unhappy with it, but I saw the possibilities that you could uh, go into. So um, I kind of just sat on it for a while, kind of lost interest, and then the dot-com boom happened, oh, bust happened. And all of a sudden, I was, you know, dot-com boom, the dot-com times were really good for me. I was driving a really amazing uh, S2000 Honda Roadster. I loved this car. It was fantastic. <laughs> but, you know, the car payment was twice my rent. So this wasn't really going to be maintainable. So I had this really difficult decision. I could move to the Bay Area, keep driving this amazing car, or I could, well, sell the car and pursue my own dreams and possibly not get paid for a couple of years. Uh, that turned into five. And even after five years, that wasn't a whole lot of money that uh, came in after that. So then what? What do I do next? So I really started thinking about this. Uh, well, what should I do? Um, I was really kind of... I wanted to do, I wanted to write this new music player. I really wanted something absolutely amazing. I wanted something that wasn't going to be very difficult to write, but fundamentally, I wanted to say, I had a really shitty day at the office. God damn it, this, I'm pissed off. Fuck this, fuck that. Right? Start with Metallica, end up with Enya in two hours, go. <laughs> right? Well, it's not really difficult of a problem to solve, is it? Unless you have this major database that, uh, that you could have that could really give you all this information. So it was all about data, and I really started thinking about what could I do with this? What, what, if I had an encyclopedia of music, what are the things that I could build with this? And um, there might be a trend here, but uh, there was yet another party. 
we happened to have a lot of parties back in the 90s. It was just it was, you know, a good time to have parties. And uh, I was talking to my friend and uh, talking about blah, 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 blah. Like, and I said, you know, I really want a project. And it needs to be like something like Music Brains. I was trying to find a name for it. Like, it's the bunch of people and their brains being aggregated to talk about music and all the ex experts in the world. And he said, that's a great name. You should use that. And I literally just wandered off and just registered domain in the middle of the party. And that's, that's very literally how Music Brains got its start. And I took the, uh, the Music Brains code base and started working with that. And um, in the beginning, we didn't really know what it is that we wanted to do. We had a database of CD lookup service. And CDs are pretty simple. They have a title, they have an artist, they have uh, tracks and they have durations, and there's really not much else. Like, it wasn't really very difficult to do this, right? So I didn't really know exactly what it is I wanted to do. Uh, so we just started pretty simply. Um, but the idea was to build a, essentially, a music encyclopedia. Not something that actually dealt with the music, but something that had information about music. So we started working with uh, capturing information about um, uh, artists, release groups, and release groups are, um, say, if you have uh, uh, The Wall from Pink Floyd, it has two CDs, and uh, like each one of these CDs has multiple pressings. If it comes out in the US and has 11 tracks, then it'll come out in the UK and it'll have a bonus track at the end. And all of these, you have all these lots and lots of releases that are kind of hard to keep track of. So we can't really get this concept of a release group. And the release group is this album that you're really talking about. It's Pink Floyd, The Wall. So that's what a release group is. And then inside of a release group, you have releases. And these are the actual things that you can actually touch. That would be a CD or it could be an album download. And uh, the next level then are recordings. And in these recordings, these are actual tracks. Uh, we also keep track of uh, labels, which labels have produced this information. Uh, and also the relationships between all of these data entities that we have. So we have entities uh, between artists, so we know that these are, they're married, or they're siblings, or they've cooperated. Or we know that um, this artist has a, a web page here, or this track has a YouTube video here. So we have all of these, all these entities and all these information bits that we can actually come up with. And I'll get back to this. We'll, we'll cover this in detail and there'll be a quiz on this chart. <laughs> so, um, the one thing that is absolutely really important, and uh, when I first started talking about this concept, my community thought it was bonkers. Absolutely bonkers. Like, what's the point? What is the hell? What, what the hell is the point of this number? Right? This number is actually the artist identifier for Portishead, which is our canonical test artist, because my favorite track is uh, uh, Strangers on their album Dummies. So if, I need, if I'm a dummy, so if I need to type something, it's, I'm typing three words in my test case. It was really lazy. It also happens to be my favorite track. But this is the ID for Portishead. And one of the things that I kept on harping on early on was these IDs need to be stable. So every artist, and I really hate to actually reduce an artist to a number, because that's sort of the worst thing you could do to an artist, but it turns out to be rather important, because, and I'll get more into this later, but artists are uh, not getting paid, and what is happening right now is that we have all of this ambiguous communication about music. So if somebody wants to pay an artist, and I'll get into more details later, but uh, if somebody wants to pay an artist, a lot of times the wrong artists are getting paid, because names are similar, they're not properly disambiguated. So, um, right now, there really isn't, before Music Brains, there wasn't a really good way to differentiate Pink Floyd Breathe. Well, are we talking about track one on the vinyl? Or are we talking about the split track on the CD? Or are we talking about the 1973 live Wembley Stadium recording? Well, we don't really know. Well, in Music Brains, each one of these is represented by one of these ugly-ass numbers. And uh, the information architects, and back in the day when we came up with this scheme, the URLs didn't need to be pretty, they just needed to be constant, and they needed to work. So this is sort of a hangover where, yeah, okay, so they're maybe not so pretty these days. Music Brains is open source. It is also open data. Everything we do is in the open. Everything we do is downloadable. We can download our data. We put it out twice a week. Uh, the core data that we have is public domain. Uh, it's open data. When we started this, there was no term open data. Um, public domain, Creative Commons license. There's some interesting license, tr license tricks that we play in order to actually make uh, money with that. I'll get more into that a little bit later. Um, it is free as in speech and free as in here. And uh, one of the early uh, philosophies that I had was that contributing to um, contributing to music brain should be should have an instant gratification principle. I was looking for like, what do you say for instant gratification? But uh, ice cream was the word, I, the thing I came up with. Um, 
And the idea is that if you were going to tag something, and you know, the early music brains was about tagging your music collection and looking things up, and uh, you didn't really want to throw something into the system, and then two weeks later you could actually use it. So the idea was throw it into the system, get data into the system, and use it now. Start using it immediately. So, um, so I started with this idea, and I kind of mentioned it about actually building this new music player that would do these amazing things. You could tell about Metallica and Enya, and uh, sort of arrived at this point in my life where Music Brains is actually now capable of doing good chunks of that, or I could use some of the data from uh, uh, Queen Mary or from uh, Pompeo Fabra to actually really build this thing. But I kind of got sidetracked by building this drink mixing robot. It's kind of a really fun project. So, um, yeah, I'll get back to the music player before too long. But um, right now, we, uh, we started off with uh, CD identification. I talked about it a, lot, a little bit a minute ago. And we came from this world where metadata was absolutely horrible because everybody was just ripping things and putting things on Napster, and people were downloading things off of Napster, and it was a track based system. And people's collections were ugly, they were absolutely terrible. And um, if you have a case of, say, I'm a gumma from uh, Pink Floyd. I don't know how many Pink Floyd friends we have in the house, but uh, there's this one track. Several species of fur of small furry animals gathered in a pave in a cave grooving with a pict. Well, ID3 V1 would give you this, right? How is this useful metadata? Right? So this is what the world looked like because ID3 V1 tags were limited to 30 character fields. So we were in this world of just absolute garbage metadata. And we really wanted to fix this, so we did CD identification, then we moved on to do, um, well, we'll this is a, pro a program called the Music Brains Tagger. The first application that allowed you to throw your music brain music at it, it would do acoustic uh, fingerprinting, and the acoustic fingerprinting would help you identify the music and then write clean metadata tags, write our ID3 tags to it. This thing is butt ugly. And we, um, we quickly realized that we needed to actually work on something that was better, it was cross-platform, and uh, was a lot better. So, um, Real Networks gave me a 10000 was it $20,000 grant? It was big money back in the day for a project that never seen any money. All of a sudden, money came out of the sky, and it was great. And um, so they gave me the money to go start this new tagging application and said, go, do this thing. Oh, by the way, you need to pick a project name right now. I was like, okay, next generation tagger, next generation, next generation. What do I call this thing? <laughs> well, I was just kind of stuck. So I just I grabbed it out of my hat. It's a working name. We'll call it Picard. Well, the problem with working names is that they stick. So we still have an application called Picard. Uh, it still uses, uh, um, you know, it's, it's, it's still an, ap an application that tags things and so forth. It's, it's grown a lot. It's, I don't even maintain it anymore. It's quite a bit of work. But if you have a messy music collection that has crappy metadata tags, Google Music Brains and Picard and download our application and uh, use it to go clean up your metadata. Um, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, you know, it's, it's a lot more fun than actually doing it by hand, because that is just an arduous process. But I can go and tag a, a release that's com complete with Picard in under 30 seconds. And it has clean metadata tags, and it's, it's beautiful. So for some uh, a data geek like myself, this was, well, this was really absolutely awesome. Uh, one of the things that, um, that Picard allowed us to do, because I had acoustic fingerprinting, it was allowed us to create this cycle. Not actually a recycle, but... Uh, um, it's a cycle. So what happens is that when somebody goes tags their music collection, they would actually see, it's like, okay, you guys have an acoustic fingerprint for this. These tracks got tagged. So I got, you know, maybe half of my tracks tagged. And let me go scan my files and the other tracks that I didn't have, let me submit this metadata to music prints. So then the next person that came along and tried to tag the same track, that information was now available for them. So the idea is that over time, now it's, you know, depending on what your music tastes are, but you might actually throw your music collection at this and it might identify, you know, 90% of it, which is pretty good, right? So we've actually built a system with acoustic fingerprints and with uh, music metadata identification that actually allows us to do this, uh, this cycle. So really what we could do is uh, somebody could um, give us an hour of effort and take a thousand hours back, and we would be happy with that. Right? It's so out of whack, like why does that make sense? But since you can just take data and reuse it and copy it infinitely, that kind of balance actually works out. And that's the kind of balance that Music Brains is built on. Right? We have some people that are completely whacked out on the other side that nearly dedicate their entire lives to Music Brains and almost do nothing else. Right? So they make up for a lot of the other people that might not be putting in a full hour, if anything. Um, so that's kind of where we are. And, um, 
started moving along, and uh, well, this is uh, for acoustic fingerprinting, but this is the, uh, the interesting one. So we had this schema that was just born out of this project, and I didn't know that it was going to work and so forth, and we, really, I, we realized that we really needed to have better schema and we really need to have something that was actually going to work a lot better for us. Now, it turns out that uh, the, music, the music industry has just created an awful lot of absolute garbage. How many of you guys have heard of Jethro Tull? Oh, wow, I need to pick another esoteric case, right? But the very first release that he put out in the, in the UK was actually credited to Tull. How horrible is that? T-O-E. So somebody got the spelling wrong and actually printed this, right? <laughs> So how horrible is that? Well, people came to Music Brains and said, like, hey, I like this project, but really, you guys need to accurately represent this, because when I see it in my music player, I really want to see Sunshine Day by Jethro Tull, because that's what the CD, well, vinyl, in this particular case, is, is on my shelf is like. Like, oh, really? Are you serious about this? Right? And they were serious about this. So... So we've, you know, we, we came into this and realized that we needed to actually uh, improve on this. And... Um, so we started uh, working quite a bit towards this. Um, da, 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 da. So right about this point in time, we realized that there was a lot of churn in this metadata. And uh, this churn actually enabled uh, essentially a business model for us. Um, There's so much data changing every single hour that I thought about this and I said, well, how can I make money with this? The, the core data is not copyrightable and you can't copyright facts in the United States, so it's all public domain data. So how do you go about making money with free stuff? Well, uh, so I thought I started thinking about this a little bit. And um, it turns out if you actually make the data available on a uh, timely and convenient basis. So if you need the data and it changes very frequently and you only, we only put out updates every two, um, uh, twice a week and you need to import that and it takes an hour to download and an hour to import if you have a good connection and a good computer, right? That's a pain in the ass. Well, that's not a really good deal. Well, that's why we offered uh, what we call the, uh, the live data feed that actually spoon feeds changes to your server once an hour. So now we can actually say this entire feed is now non-commercially licensed, and if you're a commercial entity, you need to give us money. So that actually allows us to charge um, for free stuff. Um, and people started actually start, um, started paying us for this. Um, uh, shortly before, actually before we started uh, getting money in the door, realized it's time to create the, uh, the Meta Brains Foundation, which is the legal entity for Music Brains. And it's a 501c3 headquartered in California. Uh, 501c3 is uh, tax exempt. It's the tax code in the United States for um, you can give us a donation and you can take it off your taxes. Um, it's actually a sham, but let's not get into that. <laughs> um, so the idea was that MetaBrains was going to be creating um, these other brains projects, and we've yet to get there because it turns out that the music is just a very difficult thing to do. Uh, our first real customer was the BBC, and they've just done absolutely wondrous things for us uh, as far as uh, uh, showing the way what, how we can work with uh, music brains. Uh, BBC um, last time followed up very easily. Um, that was uh, that was fun. I have a great relationship with Last FM to this day. And what's really weird about this is that we're a nonprofit, right? So it means we're not really supposed to make a profit. Well, it turns out that the way we architected everything in our charter with the government says that everything that we do has to be done for the people, for the good of the people. So we architected everything to make it as least cost possible. So the um, FTP downloads are hosted by a university that's sponsored by Google, and everything else is covered by costs this or that. So when we actually got to the point and started selling these licenses, it turns out that we had no cost in actually delivering the goods. Literally, you take the contract, put it in the filing cabinet, send out an invoice, and you go about your day. So it turns out that we created this 100% profit, non-profit. <laughs> on free stuff, mind you. So um, this is not something that you can just randomly dream up, but it just kind of came together, and uh, that lightning bolt in my head when I figured it out was really quite amazing. Now, it really, it's not fair to actually talk about non -pro about profit and a non-profit. Really, it's excess income, but uh, that wouldn't really make the punchline quite as good. So, <laughs> onward. So I kept talking about how Jethro Toe um, was a problem for us, and we gathered people together uh, in London in 2008. And we had this nice hardwood floor, and we said, okay, let's start with our schema now, and let's just see what kinds of things that we can do to make the schema better. What kind of things can we throw at this? And we started with the schema, and then we pushed the little pieces of paper around, and we changed it. 
And then we took a picture of it, and we changed it, and we'd argue, and throw the Jethro Toes, and the Tape Boy cases, and all these other bizarre cases that I had no clue. With. There's one guy from Freebase, which is now acquired by Google. Uh, he would just show up, and he would just... Oh, well, and then there's this case where you've got this Danish crazy band, and they do these really bizarre things. So he was a walking edge, uh, uh, edge case generator for us. It was absolutely amazing to have this guy present. Really amazing. So we spent literally 72 hours uh, pushing these little pieces of paper around, which then, in the end, actually yielded this, <coughs> which there, there will be a quiz on, right? Um, they, believe it or not, this is one layer of information. There are at least two more layers of information and the ancillary, ancillary layers of information that make up music rights, right? But this is the one that really matters. And uh, I could quiz this guy about all kinds of things and he could tell you about them. So this is, this, is the, this is the core of everything we do and it's plenty complicated. And it's complicated because the music industry has created all this crappy metadata that we need to crappily represent accurately. Ah, oh, frustrating. But um, in this uh, summit that we had, we had uh, five really, really invested people that were there. And really, my contribution was just going to get sandwiches and make sure that uh, we all kind of stayed on track. I didn't really contribute all that much, except for sandwiches. Right? There were a lot of people that cared, including this uh, almost reclusive person whose his brain is like, should be about this big. You know, he's written so many things for music brains. His name is Lucas Lewinsky. And he continues to make, uh, do all these amazing things for us. So he's the one that originally came up with that, uh, that complex diagram and uh, put all the pieces together and so forth. Amazing person, loving community that's making all of these things happen. So a nonprofit allows you to do many amazing things. So once we started actually uh, getting into this, we got uh, more customers. We have Last.fm, BBC, Songkick. Well, Songkick is a user of our data, not actually paying us data. I need to go over and uh, kick in around a little bit. Um, Google, in the case of uh, Freebase and YouTube. Uh, very soon, YouTube will be drivable with Music Brains IDs, which is really exciting to us. Um, Amazon, AOL, GrooveShark, Music Smash, UPF, as of uh, this last weekend, Echo Nest. And most of these companies even pay us, which is really quite good. So that kind of catches up sort of to where we are today. And um, the things would, that really matter to me going forward are actually trying to fix the music industry. I, I can't really say this too loudly because I was at Universal Music in this last past week and I was trying to get them to use our data and so forth. And the music industry has a lot of problems, a lot of problems. Um, in particular, this is a guy named John Williams. Right? He's, he's just the most graspable concept, but this problem is absolutely rampant, right? He sells a lot of music in iTunes. And he gets a lot of money. He, unfortunately, gets too much money. Because there's this guy, John Williams. He's a guitarist, and I think in Australia, he doesn't get any money, right? Because his name is the same, and it's not properly disambiguated in iTunes. So iTunes has this problem. They have this problem. Everybody has this problem. Last FM has this problem. Spotify has this problem. And everybody does all of these data matching algorithms that oftentimes get things wrong. So it turns out that money doesn't actually go into the right pockets. And when it does go in the right pockets, it goes into, well, if it goes into the pockets of the labels, then it doesn't necessarily really make it all the way to the, uh, to the artists. So this is very much a problem. This is a problem with uh, performing rights societies. This is a problem with labels. This is a problem with internet companies. Everybody has got the same problem. So really, what we're trying to do is we're trying to, at least this is my personal goal, what I would like to do is like to have the money that actually comes from consumers actually end up in the pockets of the artists. It's really starting to be a, a problem that I want to solve. Like, like I said, this is not necessarily a goal that Music Brains has just yet, but we're trying to bring all these data sources in, and we're trying to get the Music Brains IDs into the data sources, the, the music labels, so that they publish our stuff, or publish their stuff with our IDs embedded in them. And um, because then we can all, all of the companies, all of the labels, all of the rights societies, all of the internet companies can have an unambiguous communication about music. Um, this will lead to better music services where there's more interoperability. Right now, there's a lot of lock-in. You can go to Spotify, but you're kind of locked in the Spotify world. You're kind of locked into the iTunes world. There isn't much interoperability. You can't take your playlist with you, right? I would like to fix that. And there's, you know, when we can do more interoperability and people can actually vote with their feet and say, I'm gonna take my data elsewhere. I'm gonna go somewhere else. Well, Music Brains can enable that because we're all speaking the same language, right? Um, but ultimately, it's about these guys. These guys need to get paid for, because right now, they're not getting paid. 
The labels will tell you plenty that they're getting paid, but um, it's just the money is going somewhere else. Right? For every dollar that gets in for your average artist, if they get five cents or less, you know, they consider them some, themselves lucky. So it's really not a good deal for artists. So we like to, I like to fix that. I like to see if we can actually uh, make the money flow in better ways and make the music industry more transparent and see if we can actually put the thumb screws on the people that are putting the money in their pockets. Right? I, I just hope that they won't watch this video because they'll just give it away. But it turns out that a lot of people that, ha that are actually part of this problem, they're not actually on the internet watching videos about how to fix the problem. So uh, I'm not sure if they're ever going to see this. Anyways, so the conclusion here is that if you're an end user, please come to Music Brains, clean up your music collection, help us remove duplicates, help us add more data, help us make our data better. Um, if you're a researcher, please use your data to do your research, make your research better. Um, we have lots of information about where you can find other information about music. Um, if you'd like to have a discussion about uh, how to work with us, we have two Music Brains people on site, I'd love to have a discussion with you afterwards. Um, if you're into music, oh well, if you're an entrepreneur, we'd love for you to build your products and our data. Um, we make it easy for people to use our data, public domain, you can use it for free. As you grow, um, we're really interested in working with you. We're not, as a, unlike our competition, we're not interested in fleecing you for money. We're interested in building partnerships because we really want everyone to use our data and make everything better. Bottom line is, if you're into music, you should bring your music friends. But that's my thought. Thank you. <laughs>